So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending the Just Green Partnerships Advocacy Day. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some tips and tricks about how to be an effective legislative advocate. There really are three main things to think about is knowing yourself, knowing the legislator and knowing the issue, okay? So I'll just drill down a little bit into each of those categories. And uh, so when you know, you know yourself, you introduce yourself. It's important for them to know who they're talking to. So state your credentials or affiliations and your reason for being there. It's important, I know this sounds you know, obvious, but sometimes people are very angry about an injustice or uh, passionate about an issue and it's important to be cordial and friendly and really cult a good relation, cultivate a good relationship with your host. Uh, the first thing I usually do is, but is to be respectful of both their and our time um, and be able to be mindful of that throughout the meeting by asking right away how much time they have with you today. Um, I always offer the specific bill numbers and prime sponsors so that that's sort of how offices work. That's how they operate. That's what they want to know. That's what they're going to go and look up. A lot of times they'll look up the bill while you're talking about it and they'll look and see how many members are on it, what committee it's in, etc. So the important thing is to be prepared to explain any personal impact the issue has or tell a compelling personal story because it can, things can get very wonky very quickly and you don't wanna be arguing over parts per million or get deep in the, in the uh, weeds. You wanna make sure that you're really uh, talking about how it affects you and how it affects your loved ones and your neighborhood and community and your state. So part two is know the legislator. You gotta know who you're talking to just like they need to know who they're talking to. So if you're a constituent, definitely let them know that. And remember that legislators work for you. They're public servants. And be aware of the legislator's bio and seek to find some common ground. So a lot of times uh, legislators will have pet issues. Maybe it's children, maybe it's labor, maybe it's the military, maybe it's the elderly. But it's important to find out what those uh, hooks might be and, and uh, tie it into whatever degree practicable to the topic at hand. It's sort of like um, a first date where you're looking for commonality and looking to build that relationship. Know the legislator's party affiliation, any committee memberships they might have, their background, their position on the issue whenever possible, and the reason for that position. I support you because my wife is a breast cancer survivor or I have a child with autism or whatever the case, or developmental disability whatever the case may be. Uh, that's a big problem in my, drinking water contamination is a big problem in my district. It's good to know those things, to leverage them. Uh, and make sure you thank the public official or their staff for the meeting and follow up with an email to deepen the relationship afterwards. Uh, it's important, even if you uh, just met with a legislative director or a chief of staff, a lot of times those people are the ones that are very knowledgeable about issues and that's their job to be. And they are the ones who can help you live on after your meeting with the legislator is over and advocate, be an advocate for you inside of that office. So third and probably most important is to know the issue. And I don't mean you need to have a super deep, deep knowledge uh, and you don't have to feel like you need to be an expert in that respect but stick to the subject at hand. Uh, bring your materials, your support memo, media coverage, recent science, list of supporters or other succinct material with you to help make your case. Always be honest. If you don't know something, it's okay. Just say so and commit to getting back to them with the answer. Uh, legislators and their staff can have some very interesting questions that you did not anticipate in advance. And it will just make you better and more prepared for the next time you talk to the le another legislator. So uh, just tell them you don't know and commit to getting back to them with the answer, which builds the relationship and starts to get them to consider you as a resource on that particular topic. And then they begin to turn to you even when you're not 
uh, reaching out to them. So uh, make sure you prioritize the points you wish to make and ensure the most important ones get spoken to. Uh, time can go very quickly sometimes at this meeting, these meetings, and um, you want to make sure that you make the most important and salient points. So, and offer to make yourself available as a resource to uh, make that very uh, overt offer to for them to consider you a resource. Know exactly what you're asking. What is the before going into the meeting? Make sure you know what your goal is for this particular meeting. And you always want to bring that legislator at least one step further from wherever they were before uh, you showed up on their level of awareness or involvement. Okay, so it might be a committee vote. It might be asking them to co-sponsor the bill, to talk it up in conference with their peers. Uh, maybe it's just to read the bill. No, I never heard of this issue before in my life. I will look into it. But make sure to get a commitment to whatever the concrete next steps are. Uh, be prepared to anticipate and counter opposition arguments or, or uh, opposition ideas like, well, can, we af can the state afford it? That may be prepared to act as a counterweight to, you know, economic arguments, for example, about why it can't be done or why it will hurt something else or why it's not a good idea. And make sure that you wrap up by reviewing the meeting outcomes so that you can make sure that what they said is what you heard and vice versa. What they heard is what you said so that you're reiterating at the end of the meeting commitments they made and commitments you made and then when you would be checking back in with them. For example, a lot of times when you meet with staff, they'll say, oh, I'll, I'll talk to my boss and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you or I'll find out what, whether or not the answer is yes to voting on it in committee or co-sponsoring it or whatever the case may be. And so then I usually say, okay, will you be able to have spoken to the, them by Friday? And so you want a specific date and you know, a specific time. Okay, I'll, I'll reach out to you early Friday afternoon and see if you've been able to make that connection yet. So it's concrete. And then they feel like it's real and they've got to you know, actually follow up. And also you're making it real by, by following up yourself. Follow up is everything uh, in advocacy. And so we'll be tracking all of that and uh, have a better understanding of how much we, progress we've made as a result to this day. And I will say that we've gotten uh, numerous laws passed protecting children from bisphenol and toxic carcinogenic tris and a Child Safe Products Act and e-waste recycling and all kinds of uh, progressive bills because of efforts like these lobby days. So you make a huge difference. Um, they often meet with corporate lobbyists. They don't, they don't often meet with the general public. And so you have a real impact on this day. So thanks again, and make sure you have fun. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch. I just like to walk through how this will work tomorrow. Um, so you can join the advocacy day by clicking on the zoom link. Uh, it's in your calendar invitation, and you'll receive it a couple times by email as well. Um, at 930 a.m. Eastern time for anyone joining us from out of state, uh, we'll be providing a short introduction to the event. Um, provide tips on how to lobby and give folks a chance to ask any questions that you might have. Um, that can be about the logistics of the event or it can be about the uh, issues themselves. Um, anything you have a question about, uh, that is the time to address it. Um, then at 1015, everyone will be divided into their groups and sent into their breakout rooms um, inside of the Zoom meeting uh, where you can introduce yourself to your teammates, uh, get acquainted and work out who talks about what issues and who will be taking notes from the meetings. Then from 1030 to 1230, you'll be meeting with legislators. Each of those meetings will be about 25 minutes. Um, it could be more, it could be less, um, but around there. Um, and I'll be sending the legislators into your breakout rooms so you don't have to worry about organizing any of that. Um, you just need to be present and active. Um, either during or in between meetings, uh, we ask that one member of each team fills out a Google form um, that we're providing you, letting us know uh, how the meeting with the legislator went um, and 
of where they stand on our issues and whether either we or they have to do any follow-up. Um, from 12.30 to 1, we'll take a quick lunch break. Um, and then we'll be back to meeting with legislators from 1 to 3.30. At the end, um, we'll all meet in the main lobby to debrief and talk about how the advocacy day went. And um, if at any time during any of this, you run into any technical problems, uh, you can reach me at greg at chni.org. Um, you can contact me inside of the Zoom meeting or you can call my phone. Um, and if you ever drop out of the Zoom or whatever, uh, don't panic. Uh, just log back in and I will set you back with your breakout group. We're gonna let you know what we'll be talking to legislators about today, that we have five issues that we'll be covering in each of these meetings. And uh, the first one is personal care product ingredient disclosure. California has passed a law that requires disclosure of certain chemicals and ingredients that are not on the label. Uh, you'll see the word fragrance, and that could be any combination of about 3,000 chemicals, could be 50 or 60 chemicals that they don't have to tell you about. And there are other contaminants that uh, New York's bill would also require them to disclose, as well as what environmental hazards and health hazards they may pose. Um, it, the, uh, the bill will also ban a handful of some of the worst chemicals that are found in personal care products. So people have the right to know what they're buying and slathering on their skin. And this bill will uh, offer that for New Yorkers. The second bill is a flame retardant chemicals in multi multiple product sectors ban. And this is part of uh, the coalition's historic work uh, in which we banned several PBDE flame retardant chemicals and uh, several chlorinated tris flame retardant chemicals. And this will uh, ban toxic flame retardants in mattresses, furniture, and electronic enclosures. Um, many of these chemicals are carcinogens, reproductive toxicants, endocrine disruptors, and developmental neurotoxicants. So they lower IQ, uh, wreak havoc with the reproductive system and cause cancer. And they pose particular hazards to firefighters, children, especially toddlers and pregnant women. So this legislation bans the use of these chemicals across some very major product sectors, mattresses, furniture and electronic enclosures. Uh, other states have taken action on some of these sectors and the European Union has taken action on electronic enclosures. And it's time that New York has caught up with these other locations to uh, drive the market away from the use of these hazards. Uh, we're also going to be talking to legislators about a single use hotel toiletry ban. Uh, small personal care product bottles that are offered at hotels you're familiar with the practice, uh, are wasteful at several crucial points. They're wasteful of the contents because we often just slather our, our face really quickly with a little bit of lotion as we run out the door. And that any unused portion of those uh, toiletries get discarded every single day in every single hotel room across the entire state. Uh, they produce enormous amounts of plastic and they uh, also contaminate water with the contents of those bottles that didn't even get used. So uh, refillable dispensers are becoming much more commonplace in, hotel, in the hotel industry and elsewhere. And New York would be joining California in banning single-use hotel toiletries to mitigate the promulgation of single-use plastics. So New York has already banned plastic bags and styrofoam, and now this would be the next uh, obvious, unnecessary use of single-use plastic. Um, New York and California being the two biggest blue states with really big economies and really big uh, populations can really do a lot to drive the entire nation away from these harmful practices. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the next bill is packaging extended producer responsibility. Solid waste management is a nightmare. It's a major burden to taxpayers and local governments, especially since China stopped accepting 
the waste from the entire West. And uh, it's become a burgeoning problem that's really breaking uh, localities financially and just con contributing to a, a massive failure of recycling in general. So among the most common and challenging solid waste categories is packaging. And corporations that produce the packaging have not demonstrated a willingness to reduce their non-recyclable packaging without a meaningful incentive. So this legislation shifts the responsibility of packaging recycling from the taxpayer and the municipalities to the companies that are creating the solid waste to begin with, which would provide a really strong uh, packaging uh, reduction incentive. And we've also worked in some toxic use reduction incentives into this bill language in the, uh, the A-print as well. So we're the last uh, bill, but certainly not least, is eliminating lead in school drinking water. There's no safe level of lead exposure, especially for children. And school-age children are not even tested for lead. Children are tested a couple of times during their regular pediatric health maintenance at the ages of one and three, and then that's it. So this bill will set action levels, new action levels for lead in tap water at school at five parts per billion with required testing. And when the lead concentration exceeds the new action level, schools will create and implement an action plan to supply staff and students with safe drinking water. So they'll report to the state, notify the parents, and then uh, put a, a, an action plan in place to make sure that the drinking water is safe. Okay, so those are the five issues that we need to make sure we uh, organize our time well at each meeting to touch upon.